Sandia Sashadri. Sandia, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so excited for the launch of your show and very excited and honored to be a guest here. Yes, absolutely. So now I wanted to, first of all, let the audience know all about your story, your background, and how did you get into commercial real estate? So like most Asian geeks, you know, I was decent in math. I got an engineering degree, got a <laughs> job. And yeah. then what, while in the middle of that job, I realized that a lot of people with business background were making all the decisions while mm -hmm. we, the technical engineers just executed on those, so <laughs> get on the other side of it, understand mm -hmm. how they made their decisions. So my company was kind enough to pay for me to go get an MBA part-time, nice. which is what I did. And then I moved over to the business side myself. And mm -hmm. I also joined several investor clubs and actively trading much more in the stock market than just the passive way that we all do, mm -hmm. you know, by default. We put a portion yeah. of our money into 401k and so you're automatically trading mutual funds without realizing it. Yeah. So then the, when, you know, I had started having a family and the corporate travel was getting to be difficult, I had to go to Taiwan, Israel, places like that at short notice. So then mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Um, so then I became a full-time mom and investor in the stock market. Just a couple of hours of trading was enough for me to make a decent amount of money. And then that was available for my kiddos in their young years, you know, to preschool age and stuff. And then I always wanted to have something to do with real estate, but mm -hmm. I didn't grow a handy person background to be able to fix and flip things. And I thought I could mm -hmm. you know, uh, get that phone call on Thanksgiving day to fix a leaky toilet and <laughs> what's feeling. And when I analyzed it financially, the margins just didn't seem big enough. I felt like I would maybe make three, 400 a month and I could easily mm -hmm. do that by trading stocks and not getting into a recourse loan and all the other headaches of it. So right. the 14, you know, tenants, toilets, trash and termites just wasn't mm -hmm. in my cards. So I avoided it. And when a friend told me that you could do large scale multifamily as an asset manager, have something mm -hmm. to do with real estate, have a small business for the tax advantages and employ people at your property with a third party property management company. Mm -hmm. That was appealing. So I attended a weekend webinar uh, seminar all about it in person actually and mm -hmm. met a lot of people doing this in the dallas area i've mm -hmm. lived here in the dallas area for over 30 years so this is my market and i found this large group like 500 people doing business here doing exactly this and that made a lot of sense so i joined a mentoring program which accelerated mm -hmm. me to first passively investing and then mm -hmm. also on the active side so i do both great right now oh okay great so you started off as passive first and then moved into active Yes, I did have uh, several passive deals because I had corporate America, my retirement money, mm -hmm. and I moved into an IRA and I was able to invest ah, okay. with that. While mm -hmm. learning the ropes, you know, it's sort of like I imagine the general partners to be like the pilots of an aircraft. So first yeah. I want to be a passenger and experience a plane ride, mm -hmm. then maybe be a co-pilot and then fly <laughs> an aircraft, right? That's uh, kind of how I looked into it. So mm -hmm. I had to know like to be a passive, right? So if you're Got going it. to go about everywhere saying, oh, passive investing is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but you don't actually do it yourself, then it's like, oh, <laughs> you yeah. know what it's like, right? To actually right. fork over $50,000 of money to somebody mm -hmm. else and let them have full control over it. You have mm -hmm. no say in how that works. That's passive. That's what yeah. we all do with the stock market, with mutual funds, right. or Amazon stock. We are passive. We have no say in how the company is run. But mm -hmm. we hope we make profits from it, right? Yeah. Well, to tell me more about the differences between active versus passive investing. I know since you've mm -hmm. experienced both, you know, I think it, there's definitely advantages and maybe disadvantages to both. So can you kind of explain, you know, the differences between those two? Sure. Passive investing, the huge advantage is that you don't do any work for it. You're not trading your time for money, right? So every hour that you work a W2 job, maybe you get paid for it. And when you stop working, you don't get paid for it, right? Mm -hmm. Versus in passive investing, the money keeps coming. It's like making money while you sleep, mailbox money or sitting mm -hmm. and relaxing on the beach and the check yeah. stores still keep coming or the ACH. So mm -hmm. passive investing, you don't have to do any work. So it's sort of like dividend stocks in the sense you get some cash flow. And then the end, mm -hmm. when you sell your to get the benefits of appreciation, but without taking on all the risks. So you're not signing a loan. You're not doing the day-to-day -day work for it. So you have still your time left for you to mm -hmm. go and pursue whatever your other passion is. Maybe it's a job, maybe it's something else that you're really good at, right? That you'd rather do than spend time looking at whether it's apartments or self-storage or anything else. So that's the benefit mm -hmm. of being passive is you don't have any liabilities. So if the building burns and some, you know, tenant wants to sue somebody, you're not taking on that risk either. You're not taking the liability. 
Right. Yeah. That's the benefit of passive. Now with active, the benefit is you make more money, right? Because you're doing all the work every day. You're taking on all the risk. You're wiring that hard money, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Before the deal closes, you're taking that big risk. You're the one that anybody's going to ultimately hold responsible if something goes wrong. It doesn't matter if some vendor screwed up. The city is going to hold you accountable right? The lender is holding you accountable. You're signing big loans. You're responsible for other people's money if it's a syndication, right? Mm -hmm. So those are all the risks you take on as a general partner, but the benefit is also the payoff is bigger. You get a bigger slice of the pie, you know, above what a passive investor gets. So that's the trade-off. Got it. So, you know, it makes sense how you started off in the passive side, like as a passenger, like you were saying, moving to co-pilot and then pilot. I like that analogy that you use. Um, So can you, since you do have experience, um, you know, day trading, you're familiar with stocks. Can you explain to us, you know, the the pros and cons of investing in stocks versus multifamily? Are you still investing in stocks or have you completely just gone full force into multifamily now? I still do both. Um, obviously, if you're just a passive investor in like a S&P 500 kind of stock market, then it's definitely dropped in value. But right. if you're actively still trading, if you're still making short term, you know, uh, trades based on, you know, when something suddenly crashes, you can still make a little bit of money. You can also do long term calls. Um, there's various ways to still make money in the stock market. The biggest benefit of the stock market and trading, whether it's, you know, you have an account at E-Trade, Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, it's liquid. So if mm-hmm. you need money tomorrow, you can cash it. You can get the money wired to your bank account. Even if you lost some money, you can get liquidity immediately. That's the biggest benefit of being in stocks. Now, mm-hmm. the biggest disadvantage, it's very volatile. So right. if you're going to be watching it and you're not as, uh, shall we say, comfortable with the volatility, you could get easily stressed out. And, you know, if you had planned to retire in 2022, right now is my, you know, Let's say I'm turning 65 today and I want to retire, <laughs> right? Too bad your timing is off, right? Right. So just True. because people think you could retire with the, you know, stocks and retirement, mm-hmm. the timing may not work. So you may have to wait a little longer. The volatility is completely out of your control. Uh, mm-hmm. Political things, war, Ukraine, China, any of those things can affect your stocks uh, across mm-hmm. all sectors. So that's the biggest disadvantage. With multifamily and some of the other, like self-storage, for example, they're both very recession-resistant asset classes. So Mm -hmm. even through COVID, when the world shut down and people had to hunker down and stay at home, what you have to remember is that shelter is a basic human need, just like food, right? So it's something that people will always need, regardless of where they work from, they need a place to stay. And, you know, because of the rising interest rates and other things happening in the market, the affordability gap is only widening. So it's making it harder for people to afford that single family rental home, you know, or single family home. So they've got to apartment. So they're staying as renters longer. It's taking so people are older before they buy their own primary homes. And mm-hmm. uh, so you're creating a renter's nation. So there will always be demand for affordable mm-hmm. housing. And so that's the biggest thing about multifamily in its favor is if you can wait long term, like retirement funds, like if you've got 10 years down the horizon, you don't need the money today. It's great mm-hmm. to put at least some of your money instead of automatically saving 10% of your paycheck every month blindly into some random mutual fund, a very limited supply of different funds that your company offers. You Mm -hmm. could say, I'm just going to put the amount that my company matches, like that 2% or something. And the rest of it, you could put it into an IRA that allows you, self-directed IRA would allow you to invest it in real estate and real buildings that you know in your market or select markets will appreciate Mm -hmm. five years from today. It's going to be worth more. So the illiquid nature, if you can handle that, uh, real yeah. estate's a great investment long term for risk adjusted returns. Great. And speaking of, you know, the the market and your local market, have you noticed any changes, you know, with interest rates going up this year? How has that affected your local market there in Dallas? Definitely the pricing of apartments has come down, right? As interest rates go up, the purchasing Mm -hmm. power of a buyer goes down, right? So you are able to buy something maybe less expensive or smaller for the Mm -hmm. same, you know, capital because your interest rate just went up. The price, you know, pricing has definitely become more attractive. So as a buyer, I'm always Mm -hmm. looking for bargains. There's probably somebody out there who had a bridge loan two years ago who are Mm -hmm. hoping to refinance this year and, Somehow that opportunity didn't arise. So I can help them 
well, they they will profit because from two years ago versus today, definitely the property prices have gone up. So it could be a win-win mm -hmm. for us both. The other thing that is nice is even if they had a permanent fixed rate loan, like a Fannie loan, the yield maintenance penalty on that has come down because the interest rates have gone up. So I can still get a bargain and assume their loan if I don't want to pay that prepayment penalty, if I don't want them to pay it, or I can just get it with new debt. So there's still a lot of bargains today. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I would say is if you're speaking from a seller's point of view, sometimes mm -hmm. there's a gap between what the seller wants to get for their property versus mm -hmm. what a buyer is willing to pay. So yeah. I'm also a seller. I'm trying to get rid of one property. And we had some offers and then people came back with lower numbers because they couldn't finance it. Right. Right. So, for me, the biggest thing is if we can get a good return to our investors as a seller and it's still attractive to the buyer, then it's a win-win situation. And more and more loan assumptions are happening, more and mm -hmm. more agency debt is happening, and there's mm -hmm. less bridge debt because bridge was the flavor of the year in 2021. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, this year it's been more of agency. Yeah. So people are getting more creative, doing more things like, you know, maybe seller financing or assuming yep. the loan. And yep. that's what you can expect, right? When interest rates are starting to go high, money gets too expensive from the banks, and then we gotta find new ways to get to make deals happen, right? Exactly. The other thing I'm not seeing is people are saying rents are slowing down. I'm not seeing that yet, and all my properties are in the Dallas area. And so far, uh, just because of the population growth and economic growth that's happening here, this is you know the end of 2022. We're not seeing a slowdown yet. Um, yeah. The rate of growth might be slowing down. Like you might have seen a really high growth in 2021. And so 2022 mm -hmm. maybe the growth is not quite as high, but rents are not coming down. Rents are still going up, uh, yeah. but at a slower pace than last year. Yeah, for sure. And I think with inflation too, you know, um, it just usually when inflation goes up, rents tend to go up as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it is also a good hedge for inflation by investing into multifamily deals. Yep. So... Um, can you tell me more about, um, you know, getting into your first deal? How did long did that take? I know you've been doing this for a while. When did you first um, get started in this journey? So um, my first few investments were passive within the mentoring program that was a part of, and mm -hmm. I met my future partners there. And the biggest thing I would say that you have to offer when you're a newbie without the experience is figure out how you can add value to an experienced sponsor. So in mm -hmm. my case, I found partners who are out of state and I'm here, the local boots on the ground in Dallas. And yeah. that's how I was able to help them because we had our first deal together in 2019 and then in 2020, you know, COVID struck. So they couldn't right. visit the property quite as much. So I could go and execute on all the strategies because they were the brains mm -hmm. and I was the brawn, you know, and I could <laughs> go do the work for them. And yeah. this way I learned a lot from that experience, but they were still, you know, the brains behind all the strategies and I learned a tremendous amount. So whatever I studied, you know, in the program came to life as we implemented, you know, interior upgrades, mm -hmm. private yards, adding another unit and all the other value add strategies came to life and it was a phenomenal experience. We did a full mm -hmm. cycle on that. We sold it in fall of 2021. So, you know, having that first successful full cycle with, mm -hmm. you know, excellent returns really brings those raving fans. And then yeah. now I'm a lead. This year I had three deals that I closed, mm -hmm. uh, two of which were fixed rate agency loans in 2022. So that was great. Um, so there's great. still a lot of companies relocating their headquarters here to the mm -hmm. Dallas area. So Caterpillar, after what, 120 years in Illinois, moved to Irving, which is where two of my deals were that I bought this year. Nice. Um, Wells Fargo. So what we are seeing is the diversity of jobs and the population mm -hmm. and economic growth is still driving wages and uh, therefore our rents are not slowing down just yet. But mm -hmm. we are bracing for a recession. We are trying to make sure that we have plans to address delinquency because that's something that's going to happen. And you have to watch the wages because I'm still seeing wages going up. We're paying a lot more, uh, the salaries, maintenance, uh, property management, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so um, we just have to, you know, monitor that closely as we go into 2023. Got it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, your background, you had engineering, you're investing in the stocks. I think that really ties into what you're doing now. How did that, background and experience help you in what you do today? Um, I think the biggest thing is the engineering background gives you the strength in math and therefore underwriting and spreadsheets, mm -hmm. etc. The fact that I lived in a good market gave me that uh, 
you know, automatic knowledge of the market itself and the good mm -hmm. area, bad areas. Um, the other one is the project management skills, the attention to details. So mm -hmm. at a high level, I can look at the deal and know where we need to make sure we don't miss so that it's what mm -hmm. we call the critical path in a project. So you have to dive down to the details when needed, but you also have to have the overview of the project to make sure these two or three things cannot be missed. Yeah. So I think that that helped a lot. And mm -hmm. the other part of it is I didn't have that handy construction background. So I had to mm -hmm. make sure one of my partners could cover that pretty well, because if somebody gives me an estimate to do some work, I'd, at least at the beginning, I really couldn't tell if that was a fair bid or not. I'd have to get two or three bids and then ask experts for it. So it's good mm -hmm. to have, you know, partners who have complementary skills from you so that as a team, you have it all covered. Um, the stock market knowledge certainly helped me look at financial statements, financial analysis of the deal and all of that. Uh, it's pretty important when you um, underwrite deals in the market. Got it. So, and so how did, um, has your underwriting or anything changed at all recently with the, the way the market is, or are you still underwriting the same way as before? So we are definitely keeping a close pulse on rents and other income sources. And as long as we're still seeing it across our neighboring properties in the area, uh, those assumptions haven't changed significantly. Our insurance and property taxes, we always get those numbers from external providers who will be providing the insurance and who will be protesting taxes for us because that's a big deal in Texas. Uh, the bigger thing is like your lender, right? You need a term sheet from a lender with whom you have a history of closing deals because they can tell you what an agency is willing to give you. So if you partner with somebody who's a dust lender or a direct lender to your Freddie or Fanny, and they give you a term sheet and you're able to lock in the rate early and ahead of time, that's a huge help. That's what we did on our last two deals. So right after we got on a contract, we tried as quickly as possible to lock the interest rates because we knew mm -hmm. that was going up, which means you're risking more money because if mm -hmm. you don't lose the loan, you lose that money that you're putting down as your good faith deposit. But that's one of the ways you can hedge your bets. The other one is, um, you know, if you don't have a financing term sheet, you have no idea how to underwrite the deal, right? Because your interest rate, your years of interest right. only, uh, your exit terms, all of that varies. So you want to be mm -hmm. very, very sure about your financing. I would say that's what's paramount today in underwriting a deal. So unless it's an assumption, and then in that case, do you need a supplemental or are you going to raise all of the rest of the money? That's the big question. Great. And um, so your role right now, you do both underwriting, you do the asset management. Can you tell us more about what asset management entails and what does the day to day look like for that? So asset management, because I'm also local boots on the ground, I like to visit my properties on a weekly basis. But at a high level as an asset manager, regardless of where you're located, you want to look at the same KPIs on a weekly basis, at least with your property management company, and a lot more focus at the beginning until what I call getting to cruising altitude. So the first mm -hmm. year or so while you're implementing all of your business plan and CapEx, I think you should keep a close watch on a weekly basis on your KPIs. The most important key performance indices would be, of course, your revenue. Your total collections for that month is such an important number. And that's mm -hmm. a number that nobody can fake or change because they deposit it. That's your collections for the month. They mm -hmm. can't say this type of accounting or this is what we did with it, right? So your collections, your top line revenue is a target you definitely want to give your property management company. And that's the number that your property manager keeps in mind. On the last day, knock those doors, get that money collected. Then you're operating expenses, right? So that's all of your admin, your utilities, or any other expenses you have to pay, your salaries, um, including even your insurance and your taxes, which are not controllable. All of that goes into your operating expenses. So then your collections of revenue minus operating expenses gets you your NOI, net operating income. That's a very important metric because NOI divided by the cap rate at that time is the value of your property. So um, that's a very important metric by which you determine the selling price of your property. So that's what your mm -hmm. broker wants to know. That's the financials you send uh, when you're getting ready to list your property for sale. So revenue, operating expenses, and NOI from a number standpoint are the most important. The next metric is your occupancy. That's your physical occupancy. Okay, I'm 90% occupied. If I have 100 doors and I have 10 vacant units, I have 90 doors occupied. So 90% physical occupancy. Then there's also economic occupancy. Maybe mm -hmm. I have 90 out of 100 units occupied, but only 85 are paying. Then my economic occupancy is mm -hmm. actually 85%. That's an important number because you want to reduce that number mm -hmm. as much as possible. You want to keep that down less than 10% as much as possible. 
right? Your vacancy, economic vacancy. Uh, some of the problems with that are how many days does it, is your unit staying vacant, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're, somebody moves out today and it takes you a month to make ready, that's four weeks for which you're not collecting any rent. So you want to see what the shortage was. What was the problem? Were you, uh, you know, was an appliance unavailable or it mm -hmm. just took you that long to get a make ready crew to come and paint it and do the flooring? And was it a massive, uh, big overhaul of that unit, right? So you want to kind of know that ahead of time. So when, a, when you send the renewals out, you want to make sure mm -hmm. your um, property manager walks those units to make sure what level of upgrades you have to do, what level of make ready you have to do. And in these economic times, you only want to spend enough money to do the basic make ready to get to your performer rent. You don't want to make a C-class unit into a palace by putting fancy granite countertops and stainless steel appliances, et cetera. That might be more appropriate for an A-class upgrade. So that's very important to keep a metric on what is my standard turn going to look like and mm -hmm. when is an upgrade needed. And in our case, if it ain't broke, we don't fix it. So if the appliance looks fine and it's working fine, we're not going to change it just because of the color. You know, we're not going to go put 10,000 a door. We could get by with 2,000 a door to get to that performer. And uh, that's a very important number. Some of the other metrics we track is our traffic. What, what are our marketing efforts? Is it apartments.com? Is it Facebook? Where are we getting our leads from? And how much should we be spending on marketing? If I'm always at least 95% plus occupied, I'm getting plenty of traffic. Why am I paying on a monthly basis for these marketing, right? So you want to track your leads, your actual leases signed, and mm -hmm. what the sources are and make sure you're paying for the right services. Um, that's, that's some of the stuff. And then going in person, at least at the mm -hmm. beginning, making yourself known to your staff is very important, I think. And we do community mm -hmm. activities. So those are all some of the things we do as uh, asset managers. Yeah. So, you know, asset management, you're very busy you're doing a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. Got to be pretty time consuming. Um, I feel like asset managers don't get paid enough for all the, all the work they put in. <laughs> yeah. So executing the business plan ultimately is the goal of the asset manager. And so you do that in many cases by executing mm -hmm. all the CapEx projects, right? So you've right. got to make sure the CapEx projects are aligned. So right from the beginning, you want to make sure your property management companies bought into your strategy. If you employ a third-party company and you say, mm -hmm. I'm going to go do these three things, and so I'm expecting this much in rent or this much in other income, they've got to buy into it. And a lot of people love to speculate on things like parking. And I'm saying speculate because you don't know that residents are going to essentially pay you extra $25 or $50 just to park in a specific spot, right? Right. So especially in tough economic times, those are the kind of things that a tenant will not want to pay mm -hmm. for. So, yes. you know, some of those things are harder to assume versus rent. That's your meat. That's your main bread and butter, right? So whatever is going to help them like washer dryer connections or having an actual washing machine inside the unit is something they would be willing to pay for. Versus, you know, a granite countertop, therefore give me a hundred bucks more. Like, I don't get what my guy, <laughs> I don't want to pay you a hundred bucks just for that, you know? So you got to kind of think about it in terms of affordability. So when mm -hmm. you underwrite itself, look at that median household income. So if right. your max rent is 1500 times 12, you're at 18,000 a year times three. You want to make sure your median household income is at least that mid fifties and up so that they can easily afford your rent. Got it. Now, you mentioned earlier that um, you're preparing because you think that there are going to be more late payments. Is that, did I read that correctly, that you think that we're going to be experiencing that? To come, and if you listen to media and mm -hmm. stuff, you might get a little concerned. We're not mm -hmm. seeing anything just yet, but you want to be prepared, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be prepared because a lot of the effects of all of this rising interest rates and some of the other actions the government has taken, it might take a few months for it to actually be felt. And so mm -hmm. you want to be brace, bracing yourself for a possible mm -hmm. downturn. And in mm -hmm. the past, whenever there has been a recession, I mean, places like Texas have felt it the least or mm -hmm. not even chosen to participate. Yeah. You know, <laughs> are still going up. there's still a lot of unions who are still winning uh, battles. And so, you know, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, these Caterpillar or uh, one of these uh, tractor companies, John Deere, I'm sorry, uh, their yeah. union won a big, uh, you know, settlement. United, I think airlines won something, pilots, unions and stuff. So I think wages are still going up. But mm -hmm. in case you're not able to collect as much rent and you have to start offering concessions, you want to be prepared for it. You want to have mm -hmm. some kind of a plan for you to address delinquency. You want to be quick about the evictions. You want to make sure mm -hmm. you have a plan to fill those units again. And, you know, 
get a little bit creative. So for example, with renewals, we are mm -hmm. targeting at least 60% renewals and we'd love to go up to 80% in our renewals. There's always going to be a normal, you know, people moving out just because of circumstances. But if mm -hmm. you can keep a tenant and instead of increasing their, you know, rent by $100, maybe you just do a $25 rent bump, you offer them a new ceiling fan or something for their unit, let them stay there and extend their lease. Maybe you just give them a shorter term lease, like six months or 12 months, so that mm -hmm. their lease comes off instead of the winter, you know, off peak holiday season, their lease comes off in April or May. That's a better time for you to try to lease that unit. So find creative ways mm -hmm. to stretch that dollar because if they moved out now, which, you know, you're looking at the holiday season and mm -hmm. you have to spend at least three, four thousand dollars to turn that unit, hey, you might be better off just not moving that, you know, kicking the can down the road concept. Mm -hmm. So we're getting creative in those ways just in case. Mm -hmm. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, there's a lot of creative things that, you know, I never even would have thought about. So how did you learn mm -hmm. all of these, you know, small little creative things that you just learn on the go or from someone else? <laughs> yeah, it's like on the job training, you know, no matter how many degrees you get, no matter how many textbooks you study and courses mm -hmm. you take, it's only when you're really working in the company, right, that mm -hmm. you learn the tools of the trade. And so you get creative, you talk more and more to your property management company, you have these weekly calls, you see what strategies work, you belong to a larger network of syndicators mm -hmm. and asset managers, and you discuss your and problem solve together, right, yeah. because we're all in the same business. You might mm -hmm. call us competitors, but we're more collaborators, right? Yeah, so, exactly. So we learn from each other. And looking back on your real estate journey, is there anything that you would have done differently? I would have probably um, started off with more confidence. I would have said, you know, trust your instincts, uh, trust what you know from other industries, even if you're new to real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to be so hesitant and dive in quickly. Because like in 2019, I wish I had done more deals, right? There was a great time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, the so same, you know, just because there was COVID, there were still uh, deals to be bought in during COVID and after COVID. So I wish I had bought more buildings. That would be my <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think you grew very, very quickly, though, in just a short time, right? So right now, I think you're invested in, what, 4,000 doors? Yeah, but that's passive and active. So my own, I have seven deals right now that I own mm -hmm. and manage along with other partners. So okay. we got three this year and you know, two each the previous years. Perfect. I mean, it's good progress. I, it's at a mm -hmm. pace where I can keep up with it. And that's why I still blend both active and passive investing because I like to be very hands-on in my asset management when I'm responsible for other people's money. So yeah. I feel good when I have some level of control. And mm -hmm. that's why I have to visit my properties. If I'm not there every week, at least one of my partners has to be there. And we check and verify things, Perfect. especially at the beginning when we're executing on a lot of large CapEx projects. Great. Yeah. Sounds like you're very active, very involved, which I think is important, especially with the way things are right now. It's just good to keep a good pulse with things changing so quickly. Yeah. Especially deals on bridge debt, right? They're uh, floating rate. I have a couple of deals on floating rate, right? And my mortgage just went up significantly. So luckily, you know, uh, we are blessed that the deals are doing well. So we haven't had to be, you know, on a negative cash flow situation. But I can just imagine if you didn't have a rate cap, that's where I'm right. going to be. Thanks to our rate gap, that's kicked mm -hmm. in. And so we're in the money and, you know, we're chugging along, but that's profits that should be going right. to my investors. And instead it's going to pay the bank. Right? Got so, it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, to wrap things up, is there any other um, advice or anything that you'd like to give to someone who's new starting out in multifamily today? I would say they do at least one or two deals passively, but choose them carefully. Do them in the target market you're interested in owning properties. And that mm -hmm. way you learn from that experience without taking on all the risk yourself. And, you know, if you dive into your first deal and you say, I'm only going to be active the whole way and you're raising capital from other people, uh, you know, you have a fiduciary responsibility. So partner with people mm -hmm. who have a lot of experience and actually verify their track record. Because if you talk to somebody, uh, they're going to tell you only all the good parts. So just like when you hire a contractor, imagine you're going to hire a contractor to do a 50K remodel for your kitchen. You can ask for references, right? Mm -hmm. The same yeah. thing. Make sure you ask for references from other passive investors of the syndicator before you just jump in to invest passively or raise capital from, from them. That's the biggest thing I would tell you. And then when you do want to go to the active side, it's fun mm -hmm. to be with people just like you, but really your partner should have complementary skills from you. And don't forget that. Perfect. All right. And where can people find you if they want to get in touch? 
And my website is the best place to find me. It's multifamilyforyou.com, where it's multifamily, number four, Y-O-U.com. Or LinkedIn, they can find me. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show, Sindaya. And um, we hope to have you again on the future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Appreciate it. And congrats on your show. Thank you. Today's show was sponsored by Synergy Capital Investments. To download your free multifamily investment guide for beginners or to schedule a call to learn about our upcoming investment projects, go to thrivewithsynergy.com. That's thrivewithsynergy.com or click on the link below.